One. The lobby is set up with two front desks, one for VIP check-in and one for regular check-in. Of course, this is a schmindum, so they're both the same thing. One desk is just a lie to make people who wasted thousands on timeshare feel a little better about it. When walking through the front doors, regular check-in is straight ahead but VIP is to the left, almost completely out of sight. It is unlabeled except for some stupid blue ropes and a little rug that says VIP. Guests flock to the regular check-in because it's the first desk they see. We have to have someone on the floor directing people to VIP because a line would form at regular, and nobody would see the GSAs at the VIP desk. Because we're short-staffed, I have all four people, including me, working regular check-in and nobody at VIP. No big deal, that's usual. But there are long lines and it's peak check-in time. A guest approaches to check-in, does not acknowledge my greeting and just says, Why isn't VIP check-in open? I replied, unfortunately, we're short-staffed. It is our policy to keep this desk staffed first before VIP because of the flow of guests. She becomes immediately irate and says, Oh, it's the policy? The policy? I've been an owner longer than you've worked here. And I know that's not the policy. I said, well, I can go open it for you, but it will take like 10 minutes for my computer to get started. She didn't like that answer and continued to argue with me about company policy like she knew the damn employee handbook. I'm sure I had a slightly annoyed tone. It was a busy Thursday, we were short-staffed, and this lady who is here for one night is bothering me. Eventually, I took a deep breath and said, Mrs. Guest, I apologize. I think we've got off on the wrong foot. Let's just get your check-in started so you can enjoy your vacation. Can I please check your ID? She seems to have calmed down a little. I started asking for her information, confirming email, number of guests, etc. To every question, she replied, Ma'am, yes I do. If I don't collect this, I will be in trouble later. I'm sure my demeanor changed when I realized how rude this woman is, and she said, What's wrong? Have I made you mad? I said, Mrs. Guest, I have to collect this information, and you aren't providing it. Mind you, she's only here for one night, so I don't know why she was delaying her own vacation by starting with me. Eventually, I gave up, handed her the keys and a parking pass, and said, If you'd like, you're welcome to speak with my supervisor. I had already messaged the AGSM, who waited nearby to talk with her. The guest told my supervisor that I was rude and didn't know how to do my job. She went outside to unload, and as her and her husband are walking through the lobby to the elevator... He said loudly, these people think they can do anything with Trump in office. I am white, these guests were black, and the year was 2018. I said absolutely nothing offensive. I was just doing my job, but I'm sure she lied to her husband who took it upon himself to be rude in the middle of the lobby and essentially call me a racist. Fortunately, these guests did not bother me for the rest of their stay but they did visit another location where my AGSM checked them in a couple of years later, and she said they were just as mean and rude as the first time. So yay for no self-awareness or growth. 2. I've worked at hotels for a good while now, and one of the things that surprised me at first was not just the entitlement from guests, which I've written about previously, However, it was probably the fact that anyone has the power to basically write a free-for-all untrue review on Google, Yelp, or any online site like that. So my question is, should these online sites or the company itself filter out at least some of the really treacherous ones? Let's face it, we all get bad reviews if you've worked in the hospitality business long enough. We all have had bad days where we're not at our best dealing with customers, it's inevitable in any customer-facing job. However, the impact of these negative reviews can be significant, especially in today's digital age where online reputation holds great importance. During my first year working at a hotel, I was fortunate enough to receive only one or two bad reviews using my name personally. These reviews criticized my lack of a smile at check-in 
or claimed that I wasn't polite enough. While these types of reviews are fairly common and normal for guests to write about, they still affected me, particularly as a young professional fresh out of college. I remember feeling disheartened and questioning my abilities as a hotel employee. However, my manager, who had years of experience in the industry, advised me to brush it off and move on, emphasizing that negative reviews are an inevitable part of the job. It wasn't until my third year at the casino hotel I used to work at that I witnessed reviews spiraling out of control. The chaos usually ensued after Memorial Day, when the summer season brought in a wave of demanding and impatient guests. With the hotel often sold out during this period, early check-ins were not always possible, and some amenities like the pool or restaurant would take time to open. Frustrated by these minor inconveniences, guests would unleash their anger on the hotel staff, who were the face of the establishment. Last summer, however, the situation took an alarming turn. Some guests at our hotel turned these minor inconveniences into accusations of racism. I was shocked to read comments that accused me of lying, and claimed that I refused to attend to their needs because of my alleged bias against people of color. These slanderous comments persisted throughout the summer, tarnishing my reputation and causing immense distress. Surprisingly, the hotel management never approached me to address these accusations or offer any support. Moreover, the hotel did not take any action to remove these harmful comments from online platforms. When I attempted to have them removed myself, I was informed that it would cost around $1,000, a significant sum at the time as these derogatory reviews using my name remained prominently displayed online for a solid month, I worried about the impact they would have on my future job prospects. Fortunately, as the summer came to an end in August, the guests' behavior improved, and our hotel review scores gradually recovered. It had been a challenging few months, but it made me reflect on the importance of filtering out reviews that deal with racism, religious bias, or any other form of discrimination. When someone's career is at stake, it becomes crucial to protect their reputation from false and damaging claims. While negative reviews are part of the industry, it is essentially for online platforms and companies to establish mechanisms that distinguish between genuine feedback and malicious attacks. By doing so, they can ensure a fair and accurate representation of the hotel and its employees. What do you guys think? 2. Background. I'm working a double today, 3 p.m. plus audit shift, because the auditor called in in my shift and, conveniently, everyone has plans including the weekend manager. If you count being out of poor bowling alley, plans. I know he's going to a bar because he told me before he left, so I didn't want to spoil that, but I asked him to send me a picture of his score. Good luck with that. Supposedly, the managers are supposed to be on call, but it is payday, so I'm not going to push it, because I will get overtime. Conveniently for me, not by request, today was just supposed to be my last day for the week. Anyway, it's busy. We're almost sold out, so I turn off the inventory for the night, etc. And I'm going to close up the pool. Our sign reads, pool hours 10am to 10pm, hot tub closes at 11pm. That little bit of ambiguity itself makes the maintenance guys think it doesn't have to open at 10 a.m. with the pool, so sometimes they take their time with the morning chemicals before they open it up. We had a family swimming in the pool, on and off throughout the evening, and we allow infants in a certain area depending on the parents' discretion. I wish that wasn't the case, it's led to so many issues in itself. We don't allow kids at all into the hot tub that's strictly adults only. Despite our signage, that is always an issue, too. If COVID was good for anything, it was closed pools and a pared down or completely shut down breakfast. Those good days are over. For us here, anyway. Anyway, the family I mentioned was enjoying our pool throughout the day, so they took the posted sign about hours to mean the pool was open until 11pm and not 10. So, when I came in, 
15 minutes earlier to get everyone out of the pool, the kids started moaning and complaining, then the adults started as well. That's half expected on any given night, so I stood there for a few moments and let them rip. Then I pointed out our signage, and before I finish, one of the adults screams, It says 11! I'm prepared for that too, so I say in my loud, firm customer service voice, the pool closes at 10 p.m. as posted, points to sign, and the hot tub is open until 11 p.m. And kids are not allowed in the hot tub, points again to sign. I get the normal blowback as the kids start exiting with a few adults, and usually the more tipsy adults stick around for the hot tub. I don't mind that it usually calms them down and they get to drink alcohol in cans, and surprisingly, we get few issues from that in particular. Unless they're with a sports group. That's a whole different story. So, the kids leave, and a few adults stay behind, and a woman with a baby from the same family comes up and asks where our mother's room is. I don't remember the last time someone asked me that question, and it takes me a moment to realize what she's asking. So I tell her we don't have one, and I offer her extra towels if she needs them for her room to nurse there. I honestly don't know if I overstepped a boundary by tacitly suggesting she go to her room to nurse, because we don't allow that if asked in our lobby restrooms, or at least we don't give the facilities for that in our lobby restrooms, and we do not suggest that they nurse there. I think people go to their rooms generally to nurse because, as I said, I can't remember the last time I was asked that. My response irked her and she began complaining about our pool hours. She doesn't want to be in the pool area if she can't sit in the hot tub with her baby if all the other people, adults being the key word, are allowed, etc. I hope she was just being difficult about not being able to take her baby into the hot tub and wouldn't actually do that. The baby starts crying and she said, Oh great, now my baby's upset, and stared at me bug-eyed for a few moments. I started to mutter something, and she went tisk tisk, and waved her hand in my face and said, Whatever, I'll fix it with your manager tomorrow, and asked me to write my name down on my manager's card. I just put an X with a few serifs or something, and handed it to her, and she took it, without looking at it, and walked off. So, I was still processing that when the rest of the people left the hot tub. They were pretty cool and relaxed and chatty and said our hot tub and pool were excellent, and handed me a sizable tip, and left the desk with a few cans of nice IPA. I packed that up quick for later, and checked my tips, and it was 45 bucks. That lessened the sting a bit of cleaning their mess while I finished shutting down the pool for the night. 4. I work at a small hotel in a very small town and we'd recently stopped renting to locals until our manager was able to approve them. We had a good relationship with them, or they had been previously approved, and did not have a problem during that stay. This was mostly due to damages, and that drugs are bad in the area. A few weeks ago, we had booked a room for a local, Alex, whose sister, Alexis, was trying to move to town. She stayed for a week, no problems aside from wiping out our coffee creamer, and then checked out. Alex visited her throughout her stay, and they went out, presumably, to look for apartments or places to rent, but she didn't have any other visitors. A week later, they came back. Since there were no noted problems, and it was previously approved, Alexis was checked back in. Completely different this time around, people visiting Alexis or staying with her, and she made a few weird comments about not letting Alex know. There were also noise complaints, a damaged comforter, and just overall behavior that made me suspicious that something was going on in the first place. One of her visitors, Sammy, looked very familiar to me and my co-worker, who have been at the hotel the longest, couldn't remember from where. When Sammy came up to get coffee cups for the room, I asked her if I knew her from somewhere. It's a small, everyone knows everyone kind of town. The second I mentioned it to her, she completely shut down, acted as if she was trying to hide her face, stopped responding to me, and avoided the lobby. 
She walked through the lobby once more that night and Alexis had shut the door and asked who it was. When Alexis didn't open the door, Sammy gave her name. As soon as I mentioned Sammy's name to my co-worker, we knew who she was. She had stayed almost two years ago with her husband, who was working at the time. She had left their son alone when he was sick, and we'd about called CPS on her when her husband showed up. But other than that, we had no problems with her, so still trying to hide her face was strange, especially when she continued to do it the next day, until our owner got a call from the police. Sammy was being actively watched by our small-town police department. And when they saw her enter the hotel, they called the owner to see what she was doing there. Alexis had just been released from prison with possession and intent to sell, and she was from the area, not trying to move into it like Alex had said. And it seemed that between Alexis, Sammy, and the gentleman who had been in the room on and off, Alexis was getting involved in the wrong crowd. We're currently waiting for Alexis and Sammy to return to the hotel to talk to them and give Alexis the boot. Unfortunately, they are the type of trouble we have been trying to prevent booking here, and they slipped through the net. So far, Alex, while not involved past lying to us, will be responsible for a damaged comforter and the extra person's fee for Sammy's long-term visitors. I'm sure more will happen once they return, especially because the owner is going to have the police officer who contacted her come as a safety measure. 5. I work night audit at a CY in Miami. Working nights, I get a lot of issues that would be easier resolved during the daytime. This guy comes in a few hours ago after midnight new reservation to check in. I take his ID and credit card, and I noticed he was using a business card that didn't have his name printed on it. I asked if he had one with his name, and he immediately went with the line, These people always have when they're about to give us a hard time. I've stayed at tons of hotels before, and you're the first person to ever tell me this. We do need a card in your name in order to check you in. Do you have another credit card or debit card with your name on it? No, this is a business credit card. I have used it many times before with no issues. I can show you certain documents from Florida State, blah blah blah, so you can see this is my business. Unfortunately, that won't help. I do have to verify this card is yours. This back and forth went on for a while. To make matters worse, he booked with an employee discount which isn't supposed to be used for business travel. Now, I don't personally police what their travel purpose is, nor do I, or the company, really care what method of payment is used. But this does make his case more complicated. There is no way I'm going to check him in with this rate with no valid credit card. Anything could happen, and my manager finds out. Plus, he could complain, which he said he was going to do, because he's a platinum member. I'm not helping someone make a complaint on me. I told him the information is on the website when booking, and also in the confirmation email he received. He kept saying that it didn't say on our website that the credit card has to be in his name. He repeated this over and over again. Now, to be fair, it wasn't there. What is there is you have to present a valid ID and payment method. I tried to explain the process of checking in with a card of this type. He has to call during regular hours, not one in the damn morning, and we will provide him with the things he needs to do for us to verify his card. Fast forward 20 minutes in, he decided to call Central Reservations, even after I told him it didn't matter because they can't help him, to complain on me. He told them I didn't want to check him in using his biz credit card, and with that information the rep initially said, she doesn't know of that policy. He forced me to take his phone and talk to the rep on speakerphone. I took the phone, and I didn't even let her get a word in. I told her exactly what's going on, and she said, Oh, that's not the understanding I got. And confirmed that I was right, and she couldn't do anything other than booking him a new hotel. By the way, the guy had a gun. I saw it in his waist well into our conversation. Yes, I was scared. He didn't threaten me or pull it out, etc. I just happened to see it. He almost burst into tears after begging me to do something for him which I didn't have the authority to do. Eventually, he insulted me and left. 
personally. I believe he had other cards and he was just being defiant. I also have no doubt he has been able to use his biz credit card without any issues, but common sense should reign supreme. Your card doesn't have your name, so you should be ready to be able to provide another form of payment. Hey everybody, Hellfreezer here, and thank you very much for listening to Kuahu, episode 148. And thank you very much to everybody who allowed me to use their stories in this video. Before you go, please do hit the like button and share the video with friends and family members. If you want to get the videos early, you can do that by supporting me on my Patreon page, where you get all the links for the videos on a Monday all at once. You'll also find links as well as that in the description to the Hellfreezer merchandise store on Teespring, and the Hellfreezer Discord server if you'd like to join us over there. And if you really like today's video, why not leave a tip by clicking on the heart with a dollar sign underneath the video. None of that is required, but it is very, very much appreciated. Alright, no other bits and bobs today, so let's move right along to Hellfreezer's question of the day. And today's question is, do you think certain names should be banned? Some parents like to give their kids very creative names that could cause them difficulty later in life. Might get them picked on or bullied, that sort of thing in school. I don't personally think you should ban a parent from doing that. I think there's some things parents should be banned from doing. But I do think they should be cautioned against it. And at the very least, uh, give the kid a more mundane sounding name, as well as a fun, exciting one that you thought was really great when you were drunk on margaritas at two in the morning. So they can use that as their everyday name. And if later in life they thought, oh, the fun, exciting name is really who I am and I want to use that, they can do that. Or they can pick a new one entirely. That's how I do it. Why don't you let me know what you think in a comment below. As I'm never having kids, none of them have to worry about being called Pepsi Pepper. And before we go, let's have the answer of the day from a previous video. And this one comes from Kawahu147. And I believe it was about items of clothing that you should probably throw out, but you just can't bring yourself to do it. And today's answer comes from DK. My favorite nightgown, so soft and comfy. I've had it for 30 years. Much re-sewing of seams, little holes and tears. Wouldn't dream of giving it up. Thank you very much for your answer, DK. And with that, I'm going to head off and make all these videos I just recorded. So until next time, thank you very much for listening. And take very good care of yourselves.